Ideas are all fine and good, but how do you actually get stuff done? Um, and I'm going to just read you the description. Now that we've heard so many different insights into the ways exponential technologies can transform our industries, organizations, and our lives, what actionable strategies can we take back to where we come from to help create a positive impact? Okay. So, it's not an easy question. Ideas have been flowing freely here, um, and obviously good things are happening, but we want them to happen faster for all kinds of reasons that you, you know well that have been explained up here. Uh, let me quickly introduce the panel, starting at the far end. Uh, Ricardo Vargas, the executive director of the Brightline Initiative, which is a very unusual group that's a big supporter of Singularity that's really new, uh, and is devoted to this exact idea of taking ideas and making real things happen as a result. It was pretty much precipitated by the Project Management Institute, which is three million people whose job is to do that kind of thing in organizations, and who have recognized as an institution and as a group that this is getting harder, not easier. So Brightline is trying to help conceptualize ways to talk about it, to drive progress forward. Uh, before that, he worked for four years at the United Nations, what UNOPS, it's the group in the UN that basically helps all the other UN agencies get stuff done, like, okay, how's a million refugees on the border of some country? He's the one that had to get all the containers and people and electricity and all that. Uh, and, and it gave him a lot of insight, which he may tell us about. Okay, next, Ellen Levy is Managing Director of Silicon Valley Connect, which is a group that helps companies uh, connect with academia in part. She previously worked at, and with big ideas, and she previously was at Stanford running something called Idea X, which was about helping companies understand what's happening at Stanford and helping Stanford happen, understand what's happening at companies. She also spent a long time at LinkedIn from the very earliest days there. And she also, partly because she was at LinkedIn for a long time, she's now an angel investor. And she has a lot of companies that she's investing in and helping. So she's a really deeply embedded Silicon Valley uh, veteran. Um, Jeff Tuff is a principal at Deloitte who has a best-selling book that came out in May, right, called Detonate, and get this title, Why and How Corporations Need to Blow Up Best Practices and Bring a Beginner's Mind to Survive. So that's not the kind of way we usually talk about companies, so we're glad to have him here to do that on this stage. Finally, next to me, Natalie Petahoff, who's a vice president at Salesforce for AI in customer service. And she's really in an interesting position because she's been at Salesforce, what, about a year and a half? Mm -hmm. um, and she's, you know, operational executive there, but for years she was a consultant and an analyst. So she's more like me, an, a professional pundit and observer and thinker, and she's now actually having to get stuff done. So it's giving her some, some and, and Salesforce is one of the fastest growing companies in the world. So what a, what a Petri dish for that. But I wanted to start by asking Ricardo to talk a little bit about his experience at the UN, what it taught him, and why he thinks this issue of taking ideas into action is so important. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's, I have been for four years, I work at, at the UN in the most challenging places, and nothing compares to the brutal reality. So I want just to ask you to think with me when, for example, a resolution or a decision for, for example, coming from the Security Council, for example, comes and say, okay, we need to put lights or we need to provide something for the internal displaced people from ISIS uh, in, in Iraq, mostly on the Kurdistan area. And then you receive a paper like that, and in a week you need to mobilize around 34 containers and bring them to the border of Iran and get 3.4 million people with access to basic, safe, basic light. And what happened most of the time is that it's, it's much more nice, fun, and exciting to work on the idea than to make the idea happen. <laughs> no, it's, it's and, 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 and what benefits society is not just idea. 
is the idea that becomes reality and improves people's life. And, and this is what matters. And when, when I see, I was talking yesterday to a great friend that is here, Claudio from Lee Hatch Harrison, and he was talking about HR startups. And he said, Ricardo, I received a map with 200 logos of new ventures on, on uh, human resource size. And then in two months later, uh, 180 of them disappeared. So what happened? And, and, and this is exactly what we are trying to understand. And, and some basic findings we, we saw based on this experience at the UN is that, first, it's much more exciting to work on ideas than to work on execution. Because execution is painful. It's painful because all the problems happen there. The second one, there is a lack of accountability. People think that this part of the business is just something that someone else can do. And executives must be aware that this is he or her work to do. So it's a very critical point. And when we see that, and we see this, I use this example from the UN, but we can use every single person here in this room can tell me an example of that. So how many things, how big is this destruction of value when we see that the forecast of investment in capital projects in the next year, it's almost $100 trillion. And imagine if we start losing this, you know, in a society that is so in need. So this is exactly what is the top. Which kind of capability do we need to put in place for that? And, and I'll just say before, I want to ask Natalie to follow up, but Ricardo's created Brightline so quickly. If you, if you go to their booth or look, it's a, an amazing consortium of a very diverse group of companies. And practicing what he preaches, he is really ramping that thing <laughs> really fast, which is quite interesting. So Natalie, here you are, a Salesforce person in AI in customer service. Well, that's challenging in itself in any organization. You've been here for most of the conference, listening to most of the sessions. But you face the kind of classic issue of you've got to go back and figure out what of the things you learned and you got excited about can you apply. How do you think about that and how, how do you think that's going to go and how would you recommend that we all think about that, given your experience? So I think we all need to read Jeff's book. <laughs> good, good step one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as a systems integrator 20 years ago, I used to implement technology and 89% of all projects fail. Flash forward. 20 years, the statistics are very similar. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed was, and it's even worse now, because technology is going like this, but people and their mindset are going like this. And so part of that, and what I experienced throughout my career, is that we're hardwired to resist. So there's a little tiny piece of your brain called the amygdala, and it's the part that looks at a new situation and goes, oh, is this a lion, a tiger, a bear? Oh my, no, we can't do that, stop. That's <laughs> not how we do it here, it's not invented here. And so I came up with this concept about the only thing I can control is me. And so working on myself and working on my own personal resistance, I can be an example for others. So how, how, would, how do you, let's just be specific. You're going to go back to work later today, perhaps, or tomorrow. Tomorrow. And, and how are you going to be, do you feel like somehow you can bring something new as, as a result of being here, or is it, is it just about keeping the wheels on the bus in a company that's roaring forward like Salesforce or, or, or what? I think there's a mix, right? So, so we are growing exponentially and we're changing very fast. I think part of it is grounding what we've learned here. So getting on board that the world is changing really quickly and then being able to articulate that to my leadership. Yeah. to people around me to help them understand how quickly things are changing and create a sense of urgency about how fast things are changing and then what can I do personally to help my team move forward. And some of that may be one-on-one -on -one coaching, some of that may be uh, professional coaching. So that's kind of my exploration is what exactly do we do to help individuals and teams work better together. And as we were discussing before, one thing that does distinguish Salesforce among companies, it's a very excited, excitable organization because people there really feel they have a mission, they're making a difference, it's changing fast. So the problem so many organizations have of just getting people engaged is not your issue, right? No, our CEO believes that the business, the business of business is to make the world better. So that's a massive transformative purpose and it's easy to get behind. So we're all like, 
loving that and we're all excited. The question is, how do you hone that excitement into actually implementing every single day? Right. And the truth is that even with that massive transformative purpose, we still get mired in the everyday, how do we get this done? Yeah. So read Jeff's book. Wow. So, so Ellen, um, you've had a really great set of experiences that, you know, between your work at LinkedIn and seeing it go from, what, you were, there were 200 people when you started there? I joined the advisory board when it was founded, yeah. When it was founded and then you went to work there when there were 200. So you were actually involved before it was even created. For the first at, 10 years, as, yeah. as Reed's friend and then, so, so you saw that amazing curve uh, and, and you participated in it. And then you've done all this work with academia and now with startups. What, what's the lesson you take away from all that? You know, what are, or more, more than one lesson about how to actually implement change? Yeah, I mean, what I've found across all of them, the, the kind of constant for me is that if you're talking about rapid growth and scaling, you're either in a category you say you want more, better, faster, and that's great. You can do time motion studies. You can get efficiency models. If you're saying that, but you want change and innovation incorporated into it, it's a very different mindset. And so what I've always found is like a, a way of trying to take home principles you can apply is look for frameworks or patterns of what's working. Like the, the specifics of what Jeff did in his organization or Ricardo did in his don't help me much, but what's the underlying phenomenon that's happening? And uh, you know, I'll give an example. When I, I ran my program at Stanford, it was, it was a program that shorthand to make it easy, think of it as like an intellectual concierge service between the university and what was going on around all the future of technology research and what industry was saying they were interested in. How can they work with Stanford, learn from Stanford, and vice versa. And so in that process, I had this amazing selection bias because the companies who were willing to suffer through trying to figure out how to incorporate a, a university into their daily operations and strategy thinking was a great group trying to push innovation. And I came up with this theory, and I think the model still holds 10 years later, that I call the integrator's dilemma. And I think without exception, the big companies I've worked with, big, but also in the smaller companies, when I was at LinkedIn, it was there as well. It's not the innovator's dilemma, we all know that, but the integrator's dilemma is that even if you see what you want to do, we have now grown through the industrial age and now the information age where we are siloed and we have domains and expertise and you have a P&L that you're supposed to manage, so you need to stick to those numbers because accountability is important. And the integrator's dilemma means you will start at a point, most of you are probably in this, although moving past it in some cases, um, where you will focus on the thing you've been asked to focus on. So you might see something in your organization that, that uh, would do amazing things for the organization, but it doesn't change your P&L enough to justify doing it. And uh, cutting past all the details of the, the theory, the groups I saw doing it most effectively, the most thoughtful, they were almost always innovation SWAT teams inside a company, had a couple characteristics. One, um, it was a small team, and it was either, the team was made up of people that were either long-standing members of the company, so they had respect and they'd sampled different parts of the org so they could talk to different groups, but they knew how to speak a different language when they spoke outside, or somebody from the outside who was super thoughtful when they came in. They weren't just coming and telling people what to do. Second characteristic, it always had air cover from either the CEO, the founder, somebody who said, I will suspend disbelief so that the metric doesn't have to be proven out in the next 10 days, otherwise you can't do it. Um, and the third was to look for opportunities where they could have a bit of resources. You can't be one of those nice idea generators with no resources. Give them enough resources in that team so that when somebody would have almost done a project they know would be good for the company but they can't fit it into their budget, so to speak, that group would top them off and say, here's that extra 20% kick, go do it, and they'd know full well that it would start to propagate through the organization. The nice little extra piece of that propagation is the parts of the organization don't have to know that they're part of a greater collective action to start with. If I can get a bunch of people doing things in your work, I can take over here and put so that you now have what you need. Eventually, parts of the organization, the culture, start to say, hey, wait, we're working on a piece of the same puzzle, and you start to see where is it in the organization that you can start to really build that next level of organizational engagement. But that was consistent across probably uh, three dozen companies that I worked with when I was at Stanford. It was true when we were at LinkedIn. It's just a repeatable pattern. That's really relevant stuff. One of the things I want to come back to, to you, and, and maybe basically ask everybody after we hear from Jeff, is you know, getting more into the people piece of this yeah. and how we need to think about the people that are part of organizations. But, I got to ask you, Jeff, beginner's mind, that's, that's a radical 
phrase to apply to companies, right? Uh, it's hard enough to understand what it means uh, in humans. I mean, I think of Alan Watts, I guess, when, he, when I hear that. Um, t- what does it mean and why do you think that's the, the key? Well, so I, first thing I'd say, it's it, radical for some companies, but not others. I mean, Mark talks about beginner's mind all the time, and he actually, does, actually, he has one of the more compelling, re, uh, one of the more compelling lines of thinking about why it's so critical to Salesforce's success. But the premise there, and the premise behind what sounded like a freakishly long, long titled book, it's not actually, it's called Detonate, um, is that most successful organizations, in fact, every successful organization is successful in some part because it's codified a way of doing things. And it has, whether you call them playbooks or conventional wisdom, there's kind of just a set of rules about the way things are meant to operate. And those of us that grow up in those organizations and are successful are successful in part because we followed the playbooks and followed the rules, which is a great way of acting and a great way of operating a company in a world of linear change and a really, really dangerous way of operating in a world of exponential change. And I think we're only, all, all of you have heard about this over the course of the last two or three days, we're only now just starting to see the beginning of the impact of what happens when exponential change hits organizations. The weird thing is that when all of us experience change in successful organizations, and we start finding the run, running the playbooks, following the playbooks is having bad outcomes, instead of doing what would seem logical, and that is to say, well, that didn't work, maybe I should try something different. We stick, we stick even closer to the playbooks because we don't want to take the personal risk, not the, not the organizational risk, but the personal risk to go and do something differently. And that just leads to bad outcomes, and, and we describe in the book a vicious cycle downwards. So the only way you can break that, the only way you can get out of it, is to identify, to pick your head up and basically identify what are the playbooks that we're following, what is the orthodoxy that's running this organization, and what parts of it have to be challenged. Because the, you know, the, the common expansion on the notion of beginner's mind in, in Suzuki's phraseology is, um, in the beginner's mind, there are many options. In the expert's mind, there are few. And the problem is that all of us in successful organizations are experts in some way in the way that things used to operate. And if we try to use that to govern the way that we operate in the future, it is going to lead to bad outcomes. So that's kind of connected to Mei Mei Hu saying that it's children that she learns the most from, in a way. They, uh, they, are the, they, they are the actual beginner's mind manifest. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, Ricardo, I know one of the things that, that the, the, your Brightline group, Brightline Institute, is that what it is? Initiative. Initiative. Initiative, sorry. But you're, you're not just talking about companies, right? Nope. So, I mean, but it's even harder to envision, you know, at a societal level, what this kind of thing means. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, uh, one, one thing that is, is important on, on all the implementation is the human side. We, we just discussed about that a couple of minutes ago. Uh, one thing that we identify in one of our research is that people love to talk about change, but people hate change. People hate. Why? Because change comes with a lot of instability, a lot of fear, and people act in their own self-interest. It's sad, but it's the reality. Let me tell you one case, a very simple case. We were in Haiti. We were building around 2,000 homes in one of the poorest communities of Port-au-Prince. And we had to ask people to leave their, their piece of land for a couple of days so we can build. The biggest challenge was to convince them to leave. They said, what I have is awful. But I prefer to stay with an awful than with something I don't know if, if, if it will be mine in two weeks from now. So we had to do a lot of community. So the first thing we need to do, if we want people to move people and to create transformation, is to identify ways of removing this perception and this fear that comes from the employees, the society, and the change, so people can embrace the new thing and go along and not start only as someone avoiding the change at all costs, because this is very painful and extremely expensive. So this is one of the things that we, we discover, and we need to identify ways on how we can promote this, how we can make people more comfortable and more safe to move forward. Okay, that, that's great. 
Thank you for saying Thank that. You. you know, Thank you. I'm glad that that resonated with the audience because after sitting through some of the great sessions in, in the morning, particularly Dean Ornish, who I really, I just feel so good listening to him. I always feel like, God, I, I did used to know that. Every, you know, he says so many great things. But I was walking out and I, I, I was talking to somebody who I hope is in the audience and she was asking me, um, did anybody ever really study the degree to which personal confidence in individuals and happiness ties to the ability to participate in and encourage and, and create change? Because what you just said, Ricardo, really ties directly to that. I mean, fear is the reason that people don't like change and they're fearful because they're insecure or because they feel that they're at the, you know, the, the wrong end of the inequality spectrum or you know, they, you know, there's so many people, even those of us who seem to have a lot of power often feel like there are others who are got even pushing us around. You know, it's just, whether it's Mark Zuckerberg or you know, whoever. But, I guess I'm just eager, maybe I would like to start with you because you are here in a big company practicing right now. Do you think about it that way? I do and I think one of the things that is frustrating but also kind of a fun challenge is to think about what's in it for someone else. So nobody does anything unless there's some reward or something in it for them. So one of the things that I always look at is when I'm gonna go and talk to somebody is to try to think from their point of view what is value to them and what would be at risk. And sometimes the most successful change projects that I've led is when I've actually taken the time to sit down with every single person on the team and takes a lot more time, have lunch, talk to them, get to know them, understand what's important to them, understand what their values are, understand what their goals are, and then understand, say, you know, we're thinking about doing this. Throw rocks at it. Tell me why this is not going to work. Tell me what would, what would happen if it failed. And try to understand that and just allowing them to express that. Sometimes they don't even realize what their fears are. Sometimes it's subconscious. And just being there and having them confide in you makes a really big difference. By the way, I just add, I mean, I love the point. Um, that works for ideation and, and brainstorming and strategy as well. If, if you haven't done this exercise, and you're in a strategy session, take the person who's putting an idea up and say, you will be evaluated on how much you can speak to all the downside risk. Tell me how bad is this idea? So make them take the counter perspective. And then the naysayer, who's really the one who doesn't think we should do it, make them make the case for why it should be done. Because if they think they're being evaluated to try to take the other point, you take away some of the risk of feeling like your, your, your job's at risk because your idea is bad. You're being told you must come up with the opposite side. And there is a lot of research that shows once you start doing that, people shift in perspectives and they also broaden how many ways they look at the same problem. It also, I think, is pertinent to think about workplaces and, and societies that are undergoing change collectively as emotional environments, really. And I was just sitting here thinking about my own career because I spent most of it at Fortune magazine and I, it was a great group of journalists I mean just incredible people but one of the things that was so amazing about it and I worked there for 30 years I worked at Time Inc for 30, 20, 25 years at Fortune nobody ever yelled at each other there was always an atmosphere of respect and you know in journalism that isn't even that common especially newspapers are known for the, <laughs> the you know imperious the shouting pressure driven but I think it was the key to one of the reasons Fortune was so good for so many of those decades. People, it was, a, it was imbued with respect and no matter how good or bad the leaders were, they all were re very respectful of the intelligence and the capabilities of pretty much everyone that worked for them. And that, to me, seems like a key thing. And, and you, you know, you're a consultant. How does that kind of stuff factor into your, your thinking as a consultant? Uh, well, I'll, t I'll tell you my specific thing. There is an official line on that, I'm sure, for what I should say about it. But my personal belief is that culture, that type of culture, that respect is natural in some organizations and a bit of a force in others. And I think there, we, my perspective is we should all be in the business of elevating the human experience generally. If, we, if that is our job as human beings, then we will be better people and we will be living on a better planet. That doesn't happen. We are most, especially I spend most of my time in the commercial world, world with big corporates and 
we are economically driven, especially if we are public companies that we have to meet certain expectations of, the share, of our shareholders in the street every single quarter. But there is an economic argument for being human oriented, and that is that it, no matter how digital you become, the world becomes, no matter how digital your company is, a human behavior somewhere in your <clears throat> business value system is still the most basic economic unit of analysis. So it, it is a truism that if you're focused on growing your top line, you're not going to grow unless someone somewhere decides to do something different, to pay more for your product, to buy something new that you offer to them, to stop using a competitor's product. And if you're focused on cost reduction, you're not going to be able to reduce costs unless someone in your operations decides to shift their behavior. So if we can, as, our, as a company, if we can make our mission to understand what is the economic value of all the different human behaviors and who are the people in our business value system and, and disproportionately focus our resources on driving those behaviors that will lead to better outcomes, we will make more money and we'll become more human oriented. We'll start to think about people more instead of the processes that we need to run to be successful. You know, it's amazing if you think about what you all are saying, how well it dovetails with the future of work sector this morning. You know, in Gary's final slide, no human left behind. And the whole idea that the answer to the work problem as automation takes over so many things is valuing the capabilities of literally everyone. I don't know who it was. Somebody else said, um, you know, the, the most successful innovations, the most successful situations are those where everyone is included and there's the most, I put, there was a great line, somebody said, I can't get it right. Oh, but. I think I know the line. Diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. That sounds good. Good. Like that, you like <laughs> All that All right, one. thank you. So, and what, one, so if you look at um, the uh, research by uh, Scott Page and Alex Pentland, what they found was the most successful teams are made up of the most diverse teams, right. especially when it requires innovation or really solving really difficult, complex problems. So we used to hire, we used to staff based on the top grade point, based on the top performer. That's not true anymore. If we want our technology to go like this and we want our teams to go like this, we have to look at diversity and inclusion as part of the equation. Well, the beautiful thing is it's good for the person, but it's good for the organization. I mean, that's a pretty amazing, you know, That's a win-win-win. Yeah, I guess I don't like that phrase, but yes, it is. Um, <laughs> you know what I want to do, even though we're short on time, I just love to hear a voice of, or two from the audience. I don't know if they're mic runners at the moment <laughs> in the room, but I know they're mics somewhere. Is any, okay, right here, that's very convenient. There's, You're near the front. The is there a mic runner or you want to just shout it out? Uh, go ahead, and, and I'll repeat what you say. Okay, my question is not about organization, but about human behavior. About human behavior, yeah. Oh, here we go, we got a mic. Yeah. You know, Sorry. Maybe, maybe I can take a stab at it, I'll repeat what okay, you said. Okay, wait, did, did you finish? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay good. Yeah, I, can you asking, repeat the question? I think you, you were basically saying, look, you know that there's a lot more that you know than you apply in your, your workplace today, and how can we bring more out or let people bring more of that into the workplace as a way to also grow and, and develop as an organization, is that right? Yeah. What does an individual do? Yeah. Maybe I'll take the first repeat part. That, repeat, repeat, I'll take the first part, which is about the organization too. letting more come out of their employees, more that they know, and then somebody else can take the part about getting people to eat well and exercise. <laughs> um, uh, but no, the for the first part, part right. I'll go back to my integrator's dilemma story, and this is not the full answer, but this is a piece to it. There's a hypothetical that I play, which is, think about what you're measured for in terms of success and accountability in the role that you have. Now imagine for a minute that your organization had a way of actually measuring and rewarding second order value. So not did I get my project in on time or under budget, but did I help his project? Right? Or, or did my relationship turn into a hire that was critical for your team succeeding? 
And we don't have that metric today, but just imagine if the only difference was that we started to say the things that move us in other directions, but let you do something you're naturally good at. It may not be in your job description, but you may be optimal for something that's happening. And the reason I put it out there is I think, again, my takeaway framework is that the organizations that figure out how to manage variability, and I'll explain what I mean by that, best will be the ones that succeed in this exponential growth. Because in the past, we have said that humans have to absorb the variability. I make a product, and you just decide if it's good enough. Today, I can go and buy a pair of shoes from Nike with a million permutations. I get the shoe I want, and they have to figure out how to make it to ship it right to my home address. Imagine an employee, if I can say, do whatever you're good at, right? And, and how do I manage that? How do I bring the best out of people? So the organizational theory around how do you let those things happen and still have a structure, not in today's traditional sense, you don't want to end up with a second grade soccer team where everyone's just running to the ball and no one's doing the jobs that are needed. So it changes incentives, it changes accountability, it changes motivation for the individuals. But that'd be my piece of the, the answer. Well, famously, Google gives everyone their 20% time. That's actually practicing what you just said. And, and I think one of the things that probably does help explain Google's extraordinary success is that there is a culture of respect for individual idea capa and the capability. Of course, they have a very snobby idea that we only hire people with you know, 800s and, and all A's and everything. But, but the fact is they have a super good internal culture of, of creativity, which clearly has benefited them. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but you know, it, it, one of the things that I, I was thinking about as a journalist, how many times I've run into companies I was writing about where silos ended up being the problem, you know, where, because when you were saying helping the pe person over there, I mean, in the media industry where I spent most of my career, so many companies have basically been brought down by the fact that this division is, you know, that, see, that executive who runs it is compensated for the success of their division. And I remember it used to, they used to say, whether it was true or not, at Time Inc., Time, when, Time Warner when I worked there, that. HBO paid more for Warner Brothers movies than, than uh, Showtime did, you know, and they were part of this because that was just the culture, you know, you fought yep. internally yep. as much as you did, you know, so somehow maybe that has to be Absolutely. something we just factor in the, the challenge that we're, there's so many issues here, but I love the human piece that we really were able to get to with this discussion that I think all four of you agree on and all we also agreed before we started that half an hour was not going to be enough for this topic so thank you so much for doing a great David, job anyway uh, just just before um i cannot leave this stage here without just mention one thing you said about left leaving people behind everybody be, needs to be together but we already left behind a lot of people so we need to play catch up mm. and try to go back a little bit and try to help these people also to have. And there is no better place than say this to you here, because you are such brilliant minds. We are all gifted to be here in San Francisco, having the opportunity to discuss technology and the problems. So we need to be accountable and the agents to bring this change forward, okay? Wonderful I cannot live without that. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.